What's going on? It's Ash here coming at you today in Clash Royale, and today is going to be a great interview with a guest who's been on the channel quite a few times before, but none recently. It is Seth, aka formerly known as The Rum Ham, back on the channel. Seth, it's been a long time, man. How you doing? How's Finland? How's Supercell? It's wonderful. We're still in the throes of summer here, so I'm enjoying the last bit of sunlight before it gets dark for like seven months in a row. But uh, it's great right now. We just shipped the September update, which should be coming to you this week. And uh, really excited to be on the channel and talk about it. Yeah, man, I'm excited to have you. I have some questions from my viewers. There's so much to ask you about between the update, between balance changes, uh, between ladder, between everything. So I just want to jump right into it and start with the update. Start with the new card, uh, Goblin Giant. I always want to go to say <laughs> Giant Goblin. I always have to pause for a second first. But Goblin Giant, I just wanted to ask you, because you are one of the balance gurus on the team, what do you think about his balance? Now, for me personally, I haven't played him, obviously, nearly as much as you have. But at first, he seemed like super OP and amazing. And then the more I played him, and granted, I've only played like five or six matches, uh, he seems a little bit maybe underpowered, underwhelming to me, uh, granted, through five or six matches. What do you think of the new card? Do you think he's well-balanced, in your opinion? What are your thoughts on him? Well, the ideal spot for any card would be that if you play it at the right time, at the right moment, when you know what's in your opponent's hand and you know they don't have great counters to it, that card should feel like insanely overpowered and good. And if they do have counters to it and they react appropriately, then it shouldn't feel that strong. I mean, if that's the, the case with a lot of win conditions in the game like Graveyard, which can feel like really strong or sometimes just be countered you know, pretty mm -hmm. easily. Um, and I hope that Goblin Giant falls into that niche where the right deck with the right support can make the most of them, but he's not just a card you can slam into any deck and find a ton of success. Uh, there are certainly decks that he's going to be very, very good against and some that he's going to struggle against, and I think that's right where we want the win conditions to be. Love it. And now, in your TV Royale video, great job on that, by the way, you had him in a an interesting combo with the minor which i really liked and then he died and the spirit goblins lived do you think what do you think based on all your playtesting would be like the best archetype for him um well okay so there's a ton of giant decks out there right giant kind of goes with everything yeah. like anytime there's a new card that comes out you're like ah you know giant night witch giant sparky giant double prince like all, all uh, giant is pretty much the go-to tank for a lot of uh different beatdown sort of decks. Now, Goblin Giant is just different enough that I suspect some amount of those giant decks would rather have Goblin Giant over the basic giant. The ones that strike me as maybe the most likely is the giant minor beatdown decks that used to just play giant like at the river along with Night Witch or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I think Goblin Giant there kind of fills what that the game plan of that deck a little better. I also think that giant double prince might be interested in having goblin giant because um a lot of times you would use the double print you'd like play giant in the back and then split push by putting the double princes in the other lane because goblin giant is a bit better by himself uh, i think those sort of giant double prince decks might like goblin giant because he's so much better solo and he's also a bit quicker so it's easier to play him in the back and then time the simultaneous attack yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to That's a good point on the Giant Double Prince or, or Goblin Giant Double Prince. I'm looking forward to see how it happens or what it looks like in-game. Uh, my next question for you, Rum, is... Or Seth, what do you want to go by nowadays? I don't know. <laughs> I think Seth works. I think if many moons ago I would have known people were going to call me Rum Ham to my face, I might have picked a different name. <laughs> that, was, that was a Reddit handle long before I ever decided to Twitch stream or do anything like that. So, I, it's, okay. you know, it's, okay. it is what it is. Um and I've got a little uh, little exclusive info for your channel, is that the Goblin Giant Double Prince theory can be tried out right from day one because Classic Deck is returning to Clan Wars. The Classic Deck battles will return with uh, new and updated decks, and one of them will be a Goblin Giant Double Prince deck. So if you want to try that out, it'll be available for you pretty much day one of the update. Ooh, I like that. Those are my favorite actual uh, collection day modes, the the classics so or the archetypes. So I, I'm really a big fan. Uh, so that's good news. Do you? Speaking of Clan Wars, quick uh, quick question for you, quick bonus question is one thing. I love Clan Wars, but one little thing about it is when you when you tie, it counts as a loss. Do you have any any plans on on making that different any time, or is that how it was intended and you're happy with it? 
Uh, we've talked about it, but honestly, you need to win. You got, you, you know, <laughs> gotcha. you got to win. It's so just not, win, uh, and it's all set. <laughs> I mean, especially for War Day battles, it's like you either win or you didn't win. Or you lose. <laughs> That's gotcha. what we're tracking. You win uh, or you lose. Everything else is a loss. Gotcha. Okay. Next question for you is about balance, right? So especially acutely in the last two balance changes, not as profound in the ones before that, but we saw. For the first time in a while, a lot of cards that previously got a buff or a nerf got the opposite. So Royal Recruits, Royal Hogs, Valkyrie, etc. Uh, what are you happy with that? Or maybe what are some lessons that you learned from your time there so far uh, in terms of card balancing? Do you think that you went overboard on a card like Royal Recruits? Um, well, for the most part, when it comes to balancing, the game is largely in a very balanced state, and that's a credit to Stefu and the work that he did for the two years before I took over. Um, so I would say out of our 87 cards, maybe 40 to 50 of them I would consider very balanced. I mean, they, they're healthily within uh, a use rate and a win rate that go up and down with each meta, but they're never too strong or too weak. And for the most part, those cards really aren't up for balancing, right? Like, those, those are just going to be left as is. So that leaves the remaining chunk of cards and a lot of these cards are sort of chronically bad cards cards that have been very very weak for a long time and in a lot of their situations the win rate is like abysmally low mm -hmm. so we have seen as a good example with witch that card has been buffed five percent here five percent there like a half dozen times over the years and it's never really made a huge difference in its performance so at some point you're forced with like okay we need to do something dramatic to f give this card a niche, to give it a role and a space within the game. And that's why we did something um, like really dramatic, like with the witch buff. Um, funny enough, the stats for witch actually weren't that bad. Uh, left in a vacuum, uh, she didn't really need a nerf. Uh, her win rate wasn't really that high. Her use rate really wasn't that high. But I do think that a lot of that was because Valkyrie was very popular and very prominent. And we saw in CRL that when Poison was banned or when Valkyrie was banned, suddenly like Witch would come out to play. Mm -hmm. So I thought it prudent that if we were going to nerf Valkyrie, uh, it would make sense to take Witch at the same time. And what I wanted to focus was two things, was that um, you needed a very specific set of spells to counter her. So by allowing it to be Fireball plus Log, um, that gave a new option of, of spells you could use to counter her and then also along with the lightning buff you would be able to lightning her one level higher so i think those two things were a good way of addressing witch without hurting the one thing that she is really good at which is spawning lots of skeletons yeah. i didn't want to nerf the skeleton spawning because that's the thing that she does um and to return her to a state of being like a weak wizard uh, didn't seem uh, to be the best course of action. Now, in the case of a card like Royal Recruits, uh, you know, we legitimately thought that at six cost, that was too expensive to appear in every archetype. Uh, initially, during playtesting, Royal Recruits started at eight cost and then seven cost and eventually ended up down at six cost, along with other stat changes uh, as well. It wasn't just the cost that got reduced. Sure. But we went out at six cost because we wanted it to be, um, you know, cheap enough that you could use it in decks, but we still thought it would be so expensive it wouldn't appear in every archetype so we were very surprised that even when it was that it was powerful as powerful as it was but also that it was played in everything like lava hound decks were squeezing it in golem decks were putting it in there three musketeers were playing it like everyone was fitting it in at six cost and it was so powerful like the win rates and use rates were so high that i did not feel like simply putting it at seven cost would solve that problem there's a lot of times we were watching royal recruits dominate a game and i never thought like oh boy if the defender just had one more elixir this would be a yep. clean fence right <laughs> like it, <laughs> it was a bit more than that so the eight cost was a dramatic nerf i'm not going to say that it was like a small nerf or anything but the the design intent behind that was to make it so that royal recruits stood on its own as this very powerful card and was expensive enough that even if it was strong it would not be easily splashable in other archetypes so we decided to keep it at eight cost and instead try to buff the stats to um uh to match it to make it like pekka or like golem these like expensive cards that can really define your whole deck instead of being a splashable uh defense one thing that's going to be interesting about royal recruits is how the ability to split them four and two is going to buff them because that is i think a significant buff to that yeah, card without yeah. changing any stats because now you'll have these options of like 
four Royal recruits can often be a very viable defense. So before it was like you had to spend eight and be willing to have only half of that defend and the other half was just going to go attack. But now there's going to be times where if somebody comes in with like Hog Rider plus Goblin Gang, putting four recruits on one side is a lot of damage and that's only one more elixir than the actual Hog Rider Goblin Gang attack and you'll have a pretty decent counterattack on both sides. So we'll see how that buff goes along with the damage buff and hopefully find a good niche for Royal Recruits. But the good news is that even if they do become strong, um, I don't think that they'll be in every deck archetype like they were before. Yeah, that, that's a solid answer. And it's just going back to kind of, and I think the recruits, I have a sneaky suspicion that actually will be used now at Elixir with that buff. Uh, and, you know, actually, I could ask you about those cards for days and days, and we'd be here for hours, but I really want to move into a really popular viewer question for you. And I'm sure you can see where I'm, go uh, where I'm going here, uh, Seth. It's the ever so popular Elite Barbarians and Royal Giant, right? Let's talk Elite Barbs and RG for a sec. First off, I don't even know where to start, but first off, answer me this. Like, at one point in time, like six months ago or so, uh, right around the time that you came on board with Supercell, uh, I think it was Tim or somebody mentioned that there was possibly, potentially going to be a Royal Giant buff coming in the future. We still haven't seen that. But I want to ask you about the buff, and if if the rumors are true, why? And what are your thoughts? Like, you know, elaborate more on both of those cards, and just especially the damage that they're doing to people on ladder in the you know three thousand to five thousand trophy range. Sure. Uh, well, we are currently working on a royal giant. I don't want to say buff because I would say it's more of <laughs> I a was reward. bracing myself. <laughs> well, it, it is a buff in a way. Like ideally, mm -hmm. Royal Giant would be like 10% better because its use rates uh, in challenges and its win rates in challenges are uh, really abysmal. Like they're not where you want them to be for a win condition. And even on ladder, even though Royal Giant is typically thought of as, a, as like a ladder terror, there's only one gap, 4,000 to 4,500, where Royal Giants even meet an average use rate. At every other section of the ladder, they are below average use rate, not a particularly strong card. And as most people will attest to, you only see like level 12 and 13 Royal Giants. It's not like you're playing against even equally leveled Royal Giants, whereas you might see an equal level hog or whatever at the same. Yeah, they're only good if over leveled. Like in Correct. And then uh, <laughs> so Royal Giant is a problem because even though it is not a very good card, it is a very frustrating design. So we, while I want to make it something like 10% better, it's not a card that we can just be like, 10% nah, more health, all done here, uh, because it doesn't solve a lot of the underlying problems with what makes the card so frustrating. So we've been working on a rework that is going to change multiple stats at the same time and hopefully um, allow it to be a more powerful card if unanswered but giving you more opportunities to answer and defend against it so that it doesn't feel like it's really oppressive and just locks onto your tower right away and is just, you know one of those cards that's just really really frustrating to deal with um that could be coming b before the end of the year ideally because we've been testing it a lot we, we're handling it very delicately because of course we know royal giant is a is a controversial card mm -hmm. but um but that's something that could be coming by the end of the year. Elite Barbs are in a little bit of a different spot because even though they are also not very good in challenges, they are very popular on the ladder. Uh, angry, uh, they're actually they're called Angry Barbarians in the game code. But uh, the Elite <laughs> Barbarians, uh, Elite Barbarians are one of the top ten most popular troops on the ladder, and actually I think one of the top five or ten like, most popular cards to upgrade in the whole game. So it's weird. Be that's not weird. It's just because they're very popular there's less um, desire to go out and find a way to buff them because they're already seeing a lot of play, whereas Royal Giant is both weak in challenges and increasingly unpopular on the ladder. So that seems like something that needs more of, a, of an instant uh, fix than something like Elite Barbarians that even if they're not great in challenges, they're still seeing a ton of play. Is it your view, uh, Seth, that every card in the game should be should be viable? Meaning that, like a card like Royal Giant or Elite Barbarians, they're they're looked at as as you know skillless cards, as simple and frustrating mechanics. Are, or would you be happy just nerfing those cards or keeping them low, or do you? Is it your kind of fundamental belief that every card ought to have a chance to shine in the game at tournament level? Uh, 
every every card should be viable, but that doesn't mean every card should be equal. Okay. So what I mean by that is, uh, even if we had some wizard genie, you know, super matrix algorithm come and make every card exactly numerically balanced. Uh, that doesn't mean that players are going to use them in equal amounts. Mm -hmm. uh, a card like Clone or a Tower, like like Bomber or Bomb Tower, um, those cards will always be less used than other cards simply because they're a little more niche or they have these kind of glaring drawbacks like Can't Attack Air. Um, some cards like Minor are very unique in what they do and provide a new win condition that they're always going to be overrepresented simply because there's nothing that can really do what minor does. Um, so ideally, every card would have a niche, but I do think it is okay for cards to, for example, only have a two or three percent win rate if the I'm sorry, two two or three percent use, use rate, rate yeah. use rate if the win rate is healthy. So we actually see a lot of cards like that right now that are not that popular but are pretty strong. Like Hunter, I think, and Bowler fall into those categories where um, they're not that popular, but their win rate is very healthy. Mm -hmm. And the decks that like to run Bowler are like happy with Bowler. Mm -hmm. And same thing with Hunter. So like, I don't really see buffs for either of those two cards coming on the horizon, even though they're not as popular as other cards, simply because they are good within their niches. And in the, in the converse is something like Hog Rider. We see a lot of requests to nerf Hog Rider, but I swear on my life, yeah. Hog yeah. Rider has like the lowest win rate out of the top like 20 most popular cards in the game. It's one of those things where it's really not not that strong it's just that it's very straightforward it's very direct it's very easy to pilot so even though i do believe hog rider is a balanced card it's always going to be a bit more popular than its power level would entail simply because of how um friendly it is to play yeah i i totally agree with that uh philosophy as well and especially comparing cards like hog rider i too think hog rider is balanced despite the use rates uh but circling back final question on elite barbs in royal giant is specifically although i do agree with you 100 you know, on royal giant and elite barbs both of them really kind of suck at tourney, a tournament level standard but what do you think of the the latter issue in you know in specifically right what do you think about the issue with them being over leveled or easily easy to level and just absolutely making people miserable? <laughs> Is yeah, there a way to fix it? Oh, oh yeah, over leveling is something we talk about a lot, but truthfully, that's not a balance problem. That's an economy problem. So we can solve those in very different methods. So since the game has come out, uh, if you have open chest, you are getting cards distributed equally. You're getting an equal distribution of pretty much every card that comes out of your chest. Well, we've always, up until very recently, given out way more commons and rares than epics or legendaries. The last update, the one where we restructured the magical chest and the golden chest and all those things, was designed specifically to give you less commons and more epics and legendaries to try to balance out that ratio. And on top of that... Card requesting has been the only way for you to really manipulate the cards in your collection and accelerate some cards faster than others. We have planned over the next several updates what we're calling player choice initiatives, which are more features in the game that allow a player to uh, direct their collection in the way that they see fit. So trade tokens are part one of a many-part <laughs> series of changes. Okay, um, okay that should be in this direction. So now with trade tokens, not only do you finally have another way to move up legendaries and epics at a, at a healthy rate to try to keep up with your main deck, you know, commons and rares, but you will of course still have the ability to get big chunks of, of commons and rares by trading them with your, your clan mate. So if, you know, I don't play knight, but I play goblin gang, my opponent or my clan mate plays, um, Knight, but not Goblin Gang, or maybe I said that in the reverse. I'm sorry, but you know what I mean. Like yeah. we can yeah. both play very co popular commons, but maybe not the same one at the same time. It now is going to be uh, very advantageous for us to swap knights for Goblin Gangs, and both of us get to level our cards up at a quicker rate. Mm -hmm. uh, you should be getting though more epic and legendary trade tokens overall, and each uh, one should advance your collection a little more. So now with the ability to trade ten epics at a time. That's, you know, two and a half weeks worth of requesting. Yeah, if you, yeah. you and I both get an epic trade token and we make the same trade twice, 20 epics is huge mm -hmm. for ladder players. That's a huge advantage that's going to allow them to really consistently 
maybe catch up their uh, their epics, and then you won't have, I think, so many problems with people just focusing on commons and rares because you'll have other ways to focus on the other rarities in the game. I love that because it's not for, it's not super obvious at first, but basically the way you're solving this is allowing people to easier upgrade which which epic cards and legendary cards and rare cards they want, so they won't need to overlevel the common cards, right? Yeah, the only reason that overleveling of commons is a problem is that the only way you can focus on any cards in the game is through the card request system, which is limited to commons and rares. Mm -hmm. For example, if you could have requested epics this whole time, I think you would see an e a more even distribution of cards. So by doing things like trade tokens and other things in the future, we hope that that will just sort of naturally resolve itself as players are more able to focus on epics and legendaries great example with trade tokens let's say you are uh the weird sparky player in your clan you're like the one guy <laughs> who just loves sparky sure. you're gonna be a very popular trade partner because people know that they can give you a sparky which they may not want for a legendary that they're looking for and because of that you might very quickly get your sparky to level three four or maybe even oh, i'm sorry i gotta ooh, fix that level 11 12 <laughs> or even level 13 so that means that you as a sparky player might end up with a max legendary before you actually end up with a max rare or epic and that is going to really change the makeup of what people play on the ladder i love that man i love the i, I really love the card request the, the tokens in the request system or not the request system but the tokens in the card trading to me is the best part of this update by far and the favorite thing that i've seen in quite a while uh i had like a ton of viewer questions to ask you but i want to be respectful of your time and we've already taken a lot of it so i just want to ask you two questions from subscribers before we let you go and they both have to do with new cards so maybe you can give a hint maybe not i don't know but jordan asks do you think there will ever be another one or nine elixir card in the future or maybe even 10 elixir card hey never say never um we have had some ideas for one elixir cards we have had some ideas for more expensive cards as well but of course it always is going to come down to the gameplay and the testing and what uh feels right one thing i think we've been a little lax on recently is actually cheaper cards uh, the last uh you know half dozen or so cards that have come out have all been a bit on the more expensive side so we've been trying to theory craft a few more uh inexpensive cards because of course cards that cost two three or four are much easier to splash into a wider variety of decks whereas cards like you know royal recruits royal hogs rascals etc have uh, been you know a bit more expensive yeah sure how about a zero elixir card eh? Eh? never never well you know i guess never say never but probably never <laughs> that's that there's that creates way too many problems with regards to cycling and stuff like weirdly if we did a zero elixir card it would probably still cost elixir in that it would maybe like freeze your elixir generation for a period of time so you could play it at zero but then you would not make elixir for like five seconds after or something like let that me you know you, let I me mean. give you a 10 second pitch on my zero elixir card idea <laughs> all right hit me all right cannibalize is the name of the card right and yep. zero elixir cost and all it does is it gives you one elixir so basically it's a it's a huge net gain but it does a significant amount of tower damage to your lowest tower that's interesting. Yeah, like I think that's the sort of stuff where if we did make a zero elixir card, mm -hmm. it would have to have some sort of significant trade off. It could yeah. not be, yeah. you know, just zero and do something. Couldn't even be yeah. zero cost to make one skeleton because the ability uh, to, to to cycle that yeah to cycle would be would be bananas. Um, All right. So last question is: Are we ever going to get a legendary building, Seth? <laughs> Ooh, you know Tell what? I, I like the idea of legendary buildings. I've prototyped a few of them, and we've kind of played with them a bit on the team, but we haven't quite found anything that has really felt great yet. But that is something that I know players would love to see. If we can find a really good idea for one, I don't think it's out of the question. It's just a matter of, of course, finding the, the right card at the right time. All right. Awesome. Well, Seth, thank you so much for taking the time to do this interview and uh, really congratulations on the balance. I think the last balance update was really spot on and uh, the update is really exciting too. Any final words or anything that we didn't cover that you wanted to mention? Oh, uh, I actually, when we were off camera, you were asking me about the Valkyrie change and the kind of thought process behind that. So I think that's an, an easy one to uh, address. Yeah, let's tackle it. it. I think the question was around like, how do you decide which stat to nerf or buff on a given card? Yeah, so with Valkyrie, Valkyrie's an interesting case because the most common thing that people said was 
reduce her hit points. But what's interesting is if you look at Valkyrie's hit points per elixir cost, so the amount of you know health that she has per elixir cost, Knight uh, has a much higher amount. And even that was so certainly before the the big buff, Knight had a much higher ratio. And even after getting seven percent more health, Knight still gets more elixir for the health cost than Valkyrie does. Um, so we felt that like nerfing her health would take her out of that mini tank role, which we actually really like. We think she's done a good job as a mini tank. The biggest problem we think with Valkyrie is that she was a very competent one-on-one -on -one fighter. And so we were looking at ways to um, make her much more of a splash focused anti-swarm attacker and reduce what made her so good at one-on-one -on -one fights and the most direct way to do that is hit speed so that if she is in an extended combat with something like a prince or a mini peck or a lumberjack the high dps of those cards can shine through and win the combat um valkyrie was swinging so fast that she was basically hitting very hard and as quick as a one-on-one -on -one fighter which made her a, a pretty good duelist uh, i also think that putting her hit speed up higher creates more separation between her and dark prince you've got dark prince at 1.3 hit speed and valkyries at 1.4 so it really sort of blurred the lines between them and made them similar now you have valkyrie doing a 360 attack but at you know a quite a bit slower swing rate than dark prince who only hits in an arc but a bit quicker so i think this is a kind of our ongoing job is to make sure that not only is every card balanced and strong but that there's enough disparity between different you know similar cards cards that fill the same role they need to be different enough that a deck really goes well geez do i want to play dark prince or do i want to play valkyrie and they have mm -hmm. these these trade-offs and stats i like that so clear wins between different cards of the same class and it sounds like when you're going to nerf or buff a card you're actually looking at okay, what is the problem here? What needs to be better? Like, what specifically about the card uh, that makes sense? Is that kind of the gist? Yeah, yeah. I mean, of course, uh, the goal is not to reduce Valkyrie back to the dustbin, right? Yeah, she, yeah, was, yeah. she didn't see really any competitive play for about a year prior to her buff. I think from the time that Bowler was launched and the original Trifecta deck died to the most recent big buff that made her popular again she was more or less non-existent in tournament play and so the goal isn't to like make her very popular for three months and then make her extinct again we just want to bring her back down to where she's about as popular as ice golem and knight and there's a nice balance between those three cheap mini tanks and you have to decide you know which one do i want to play um so right now obviously valkyrie has been much more popular and powerful than the others so the goal is to do a, a significant enough nerf to actually make a dent in those numbers without being too much and uh and overdoing it and i think that's it's really difficult because the game is largely very balanced and it's very easy to take a card from uh hardly not used at all to to be very very popular i mean we just saw that with royal hogs and cannon cart those cards were literally bottom five bottom ten in use yeah. rates like talking one percent use rates in the game um and we did relatively small buffs you know we didn't take the damage up at all we didn't you know with royal hogs we just made the first hit go a bit faster and it jumped it from a bottom five card to a top five card right so it's very very tricky to not overdo and i think that's why you're seeing with the monthly changes sometimes iterative moves where we'll buff a card and see how it goes and then either buff it or nerf it again trying to find that sweet spot middle ground well, thank you again for the uh, the explanation, the clarification on all these all these topics, uh, Seth. Really appreciate it, man. Yeah, thanks for having me on the channel. It's always always fun to be here, and uh, I hope you guys all enjoy the September update. I'm really excited about all the features and the balance changes. I'm hoping that uh, the new meta is very very exciting, and of course, get out there into your clans and start trading. I I personally am opening up Rumham's Log Emporium, slinging <laughs> logs. <laughs> my clan mates uh i've got my level four log i don't really feel like i need a level five log so all those extra logs are on the trade block so i can max out my mega knight yeah man i only have like a, i think four legendaries that i need to max out so everything else is up for grabs uh but i love i can't wait to start trading too bad and uh i just gotta give you a last shout out too it's gonna it's gonna sound so whatever suck uppy but it's true man but ever since you joined the cr team 
Uh, not only has the game just continued to go in a great direction uh, as of late, the last couple updates, but also the communication. I just have to applaud you, man, between Twitter and just coming on channels like this and just interacting in the community. It's been really, really refreshing. And your Reddit post. So keep up the good work, man, and thank you. Well, I got to say, it's a, certainly a team effort. I mean, there are so many people who contribute to Clash Royale, even things like the TV Royale stuff. That's other, you know, great Supercell employees who come on over to our side of the side of the office and, and chip in to help make those things a reality. And of course, there's, you know, infinitely hardworking server engineers, client engineers, data scientists, and of course, <laughs> community managers, Tim and Drew. It's, it's really, it truly is a team effort. Uh, you could hire 10 more rum hams and nothing would get done any faster. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of people actually doing the legwork and I just come on the channels to talk about it. Absolutely. Well, thank you again for the communication and, uh, and uh, we'll talk to you soon, man. Talk to you soon. Bye. All right. Guys, that's going to do it. Hope you enjoyed this interview. Huge shout out to Seth again for coming on. And uh, guys, I hope you enjoyed all the information. There was a ton of it, but let me know what you think in the comments below. Uh, shout out to Brent Chong, my YouTube partner in Stats for Real. Check out their information in the description below. Thank you for watching. And as always, take care, guys.